Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time uh, to to be here today. All right, so let's see. Okay, we're all ready to go. So hello everybody. So let's be talk. Let's talk about uh, how we see index investing in troubled times. As a matter of fact, today, you know, if you've looked at the markets at all uh, in the last few days, last couple of weeks. Um, you might have noticed that they were they're they're quite troubled. Although again, last few days, secondly speaking, the last three days they've been doing surprisingly well. So let's have a look. What's going on in the markets first of all? Well, if we go back, uh, you know, a few a few weeks, a month or so ago, uh, this was basically what was was happening in the market. So we had our market peak was roughly mid February or thereabouts so February 18th 19th uh, thereabouts and we started seeing this significant uh, drop in, um, in in stocks basically and obviously you know the, the big elephant in the room is probably very very obvious uh, <laughs> it's none other than the lovely virus that is currently taking the world over by storm now that being said it doesn't mean you should be you know freaking out about it it also doesn't mean you should be ignoring it um i'll i'll, I'll talk a little bit about it um, in, a, in a couple of minutes but again the most important thing is markets were basically having a day they were they were dropping significantly now they kept on dropping and the bad news kept on coming in, in terms of how many people are are um are uh, infected by the coronavirus and how how much it, it can spread and propagate to different countries and all those things so again, as we went on, uh, you can see we basically had record losses upon record losses. Um, you know, the, the Dow basically in just on, on February 25th, so basically a, a, a month and a day ago, had dropped by 800 points. It was one of the, the it was one of the largest um, uh, one of the largest drops it had in in recent history. Um, then we had. You know, just a, a week and a half, ten days later, basically, stock plunged near stocks plunged nearly by another one thousand points, um, and and on and on and on. So just bad news all around. Stocks kept on dropping. Uh, I don't think it. You know, this is news to anyone really, or it really shouldn't be news to anyone. So what does all of this mean is the u.s economy going to be going completely bankrupt uh, if you were to believe trump if they're not reopening um you know um up shop basically within the next week or two or are things maybe over exaggerated now i'm not trying to say that corona covid19 is not a bad thing and you should be you know taking all the precautions it's just you have to also look at forecasts and projections okay so plan for the worst hope for the best now is not the time to be freaking out and you know selling i mean it's too late to sell at this point um i'm not saying the bottom has already been reached but i'm saying if you really were trying to avoid the the the, the fall probably selling would have you know the ideal time to sell would have been a little while ago um so let's have a very quick look at what, what's currently happening in the s p 500 so this is literally live data right now uh so obviously Let's go to year to date date uh, view. So yes, this doesn't look so great, does it? Um, and if you're putting it in a five year context, again, this looks pretty darn scary. And the really interesting bit is if you're actually comparing this drop to the drop that we've had in 2008, 2009, now you can't really see uh, here just because of, there we go. If I move it like that and just zoom out a bit more. Okay. Um, you, you can't really notice it that easily, but basically we've had roughly the same or a bit of a larger drop from from peak to trough uh, that we've had here but in a much much shorter time span as a result it looks even more ridiculous now you, you also notice this very very sharp uptick we've had in the last few days um, so if I'm going to a closer look over here so let's look at the last month maybe so this uptick uh, now this doesn't actually mean that the, the that was the bottom it could have been no one knows honestly no one has a clue how good or bad the news is going to be over the next few days statistically speaking however 
there will be a lot more bad news in terms of number of cases, both in Canada, US and internationally before those numbers drop. And I'll show you a little predictive model in a second. Again, those are just their, uh, their exponential growth models. As a result, even a tiny difference of 0.1% in terms of how many new cases there are from one day to the next can make a significant difference in how, uh, how many people get impacted by this uh, based on uh, projection, mo uh, projection models in terms of how many people have it and as a result how many people unfortunately have complications or might even pass away from it. Now obviously today we're talking about how COVID-19 impacts uh, the markets. If this would have been 2019, we would be talking about how Bank X failing or Company Y failing and how that's going to impact the markets. Believe it or not, according to most experts, today, uh, the way the markets are going today, despite the fact that the, the, the value of individual stocks and entire ETFs or uh, mutual funds might have dropped by 20, 30, 35%, depending on which, one, which sectors you're looking at, if not more, you know, Systemically speaking, so if you're looking at the entire system, today we're much better off than we were in 2008, 2009. This doesn't mean that things cannot get worse. It also doesn't mean things cannot get better, right? So no one really knows exactly how bad things will be, but you have to take the you know uh, numbers in, 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 in context. Now, one of the main reasons why, why stocks have been rebounding is because virtually everywhere, in most uh, most industrial nations, they've been um, announcing various stimulus packages. Canada has been, you know, has announced uh, 107 billion dollars, and, and you know, various measures uh, uh, currently being implemented, and most likely a lot more to come over the next few uh, weeks um, as as we progress with this. Uh, the U.S. obviously. Uh, has passed their two trillion dollar ba bailout bill, if you will, or it's, again, we're not going to call it a bailout bill, but basically the two trillion dollars that is supposed to help, um, you know, make sure that people don't go hungry and uh, that people that have lost their jobs have at least some form of income uh, for the time being. So based on all that news, the market has obviously that that's very positive for the market, right? It's not the end of the world. It turns out things things can fix themselves. So as a result, we see this very sharp increase. Now I would like you you know to caution you that yes, this might have been the bottom. Maybe no one knows for certain. But at the same time, you might also have an issue where basically um, as more negative news will come up over the next few days and weeks. And th what what are those negative news? Well, you'll ha you'll start companies starting to report their their earnings. And obviously, uh, depending on what country you're looking at, whether you're looking at data from China, which basically has been more or less under lockdown for. I mean, they're restarting uh, the machinery right now. But de depending on which areas of China, for example, you're looking at, you might have had one or even two months of quasi or full quarantine. So as a result, the, those quarterly uh, numbers, once they come in, will be a lot worse than they would have normally been anticipated back in, uh, you know, a few months ago. Uh, as you start seeing additional European countries and other countries all, all around the world, as their uh, uh, various companies start announcing their numbers over the next few weeks uh, and, and month or so, um, in terms of how you know how are they doing in terms of profits in terms of how many sales they have obviously when you're shutting down the economy numbers are not going to look great as a result those numbers will impact stocks will, will most likely impact stocks again will they drop to the exact same levels they were on friday or go below it's anyone's guess but it's a good chance that things will will, will at the very least uh, uh, drop significantly and and before they bounce back up now depending on when the drop occurs, maybe things recover, you know, maybe we go back to, let's say, let me just put this under maybe a year to date. We might go up to, I don't know, to where data was about two, three weeks ago, and it might, you know, drop back down from there, or things that might just compound. Um, again, it's really anyone's guess. So the whole point I'm telling, so like, so if it's, if it's anyone's guess, then what's the point in talking about it? The point in talking about it is, is to avoid making emotional decisions. Your own, like most people's own worst enemy is themselves when it comes to investing. So basically don't invest money that you, you need in the short term, especially when the market is insane the way it is right now. And for good reason. Again, I'm not trying to say the market is completely illogical. It's just because no one knows. There's so many, so many ridiculously large numbers of, of unknowns. 
the projections can become very, very positive or very negative uh, from pretty much any point in time that you're looking at, both in terms of how many people will, will be impacted by this, both in terms of how easy it, it will be for certain industries, for certain companies to recover, uh, as well as how bad it will be for them. So let's look at a bit more data uh, and then we'll, we'll go back to that. So now, just a word of caution, this is basically just a, a uh, th this is factual data. I, I've taken this straight from, uh, oops, sorry, uh, from the uh, Wikipedia entry, if you're just Googling, um, I thought I put the, the link. By the way, any links that I'm showing you right uh, during the session, I will be putting them in the description once the live stream is 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 done done with. I'll put them in the description of the video, and um, you can have access to all of that there. So here, all of this data that I'm having here, these are actual uh, numbers that are up to date until basically uh, uh, today, pretty much. Whoever there are some countries that have reported their numbers uh, for today, uh, others uh, haven't reported them yet. And in the case of the UK, you see this flattening over here. That's just the the numbers from yesterday were update revised today. Uh, the, the ones for yesterday are still the ones for yesterday, but today they've added a few additional individuals. So obviously that drops that that jumps up by one uh, one full day. But they haven't. Re not all regions in the UK have have reported that. So it's not that the UK is done with this by any means. It'll jump quite uh, you know quite a bit more. But I didn't have the numbers uh, that will be the final numbers of the day since they haven't been announced. So that's what you get. So very important take home here is basically we have these are the confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases as reported by Wikipedia. I literally just looked at the numbers uh, in, uh, provided by Wikipedia for that. And day one is basically the day each one of those countries has surpassed 250 cases. And then you're looking, you know, uh, days out, you know, uh, post fact. And obviously here for Canada, you see uh, Canada is in red. So right now we're pretty much tracking, strangely enough, the UK and Switzerland, despite the fact that they've implemented two very different, they've had two very different approaches in terms of Switzerland shut their schools a lot sooner than the UK did, etc. cetera. Um, but they've, they've started seeing cases more or less at the same time. They had very similar gro uh, 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 growth rates in terms of number of cases from the beginning. And right now they're again, very, very similar. As I said, just the UK, keep in mind that this one will be, uh, will tick back up again once the data comes in for, for basically today. Uh, they haven't updated fully yet, so that's why it's a flat number. So Canada seems to be on track to basically more or less tracking both of those countries. Um, I'll, I have some projection numbers near the end of the presentation if you want to see what the projections are provided, what the kind of best fit model is. Those models, again, they're just models. I have no idea, uh, you know, if the model will be 100% correct. But what I can guarantee you is the numbers that you're seeing here. These are the actual numbers. So all, all of this is 100% factual. Now the really interesting thing is, you see, South Korea has they're still having an, a, an increase in cases, but their increase is ridiculously slow. In that it's in the single digit numbers or even less than one percent on certain days. So because of that, their increase is very very slow, and it's something that, according to most models that I've run that seem to be mimicking this sort of progression and even uh, adjusted for uh, a slight uh, a, a reduction in spread due to in, uh, increased uh, temperatures. Again, one of the arguments is because this is a coronavirus similar to that of the common cold. Colds, uh, cold viruses, and also the influenza virus that causes the flu virus, uh, the, the, that causes flu, um, they, are, they, they spread a lot less efficiently during the hot summer months. And because of that, you, you will see a significant, you should, you, you could, sorry, I should say, um, you could potentially see a significant decrease or reduction in how many cases you might be seeing in more northern countries like Canada uh, and certain parts of the US, right? So even a factoring for that, uh, so factoring for that, in a medium case scenario, you will you will see Canada having similar low rates of of propagation that you currently see in in uh, South Korea by probably sometime late summer, early fall only. Um, so again, we'll talk more about that. So the important thing is to know that this is actual data. This is what we're seeing. Italy is in uh, dark green, U.S. in black, Canada in red. So this is what we've seen. So there, Canada is about a week and a half or so uh, behind the U.S. in terms of progression curve. But again, our progression curve doesn't quite follow their trend. So that's um, that's encouraging to some extent. So why am I talking about coronavirus in a, in a you know when we're supposed to be talking about index investing? Well, simply put, 
there's so much uncertainty in the markets right now, um, mo- mainly due to the coronavirus. Also, uh, you know, Russia and uh, the OPEC countries, specifically Saudi Arabia, um, having kind of a bit of a, 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 a wrestling match over uh, who is, you know, over trying to set oil prices uh, and they're trying to, to, to th- they're unwilling to curb their, their production. So because of that, there's an oversupply of oil right now, since many countries have shut down industries for for a, a, a certain amount of time. Um, so that, you know, on top of having reduced demand for oil, you also have an overproduction, and that's why oil prices are low. And as a result, since oil prices are low, you you, you see this, uh, this mess in the um, futures market to some extent. Anyway, so the the point of this is, is to say that it's incredibly difficult to to say to tell which companies will necessarily do better than than others so for many people one of the safest approaches when it comes to investing is really to invest for the long term so ideally five years plus right in the short term no one knows especially with with the current environment no one knows what's going to happen in the markets no one knows what's going to happen in certain countries how how badly they will be impacted etc 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 long term however markets will be fine um, and we'll, we'll look at let's let's look at some some historical data how can i say because i mean this is unprecedented i mean everyone keeps on telling us that this is unprecedented we've never had a pandemic of this extent in the modern era the last thing that was anywhere near this bad was the spanish flu of uh, 1918 so that was over 100 years ago uh, people traveled a lot less back then. If they traveled to the same extent that, that they, did, they did today, this, the propagation, the spread would have been much, much worse. So how on earth can I be so certain and most economists be so certain that things will be okay long term? Well, I cannot guarantee you any one specific country, no, uh, uh, any one specific country will, will, will have a X number of people that will will be impacted. No one knows exactly how many people will be impacted, how many people will unfortunately pass away or have severe complications from this. But what what seems obvious is that the the the, the death rate is probably around between about 1.7% and probably 1.9%. Once once you factor in uh, everyone uh, that has been impacted, and once you can actually uh, test everybody. Currently, obviously, the 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 the, the death rate is closer to you know between two and about seven percent, depending on what country you're looking at. Nine uh, percent in certain cases, just because you you only see the. Uh, the the, the worst worst case scenario type of thing the, the the individuals that have the most severe symptoms there's many people that you don't necessarily notice now a 1.7 percent death rate or a two percent death rate is a is pretty bad death rate the flu only has 0.1 percent or thereabouts so it's about 20 times as bad as the flu in terms of how many people it can actually kill uh, so while we cannot tell for certain how many people might pass away in, in one country versus another or one global region versus another and how many companies as a result will have to shut their doors because there's a, re- a reduction in demand or you know companies uh, especially air travel companies might have issues for a few years to come even if COVID-19 goes away and never comes back although most experts seem to uh, agree that it probably will come back at least once or twice uh, before we develop a vaccine and enough people will be more or less immune or at least have the vaccine to uh, reduce their their rates so because you don't know one of the easiest things to do or, 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 or one of the things that makes the most sense when it comes to investing is literally just invest in everything since you don't know how badly or or well certain sectors will be doing and how badly or well certain economies will be doing especially in times of ridiculously high volatility as we have today so because of that it's th- this study again I'll, I'll post the links in the in the description of the vi- uh, of, of the video once the live stream is done uh, so you can see here it's by JP Morgan I can just very quickly show you what this looks like just so you have an idea so it's a PDF it's a 46 page PDF um, and literally I, I'm just taking some of the the key findings here and that's why I want to give you the the links if you're interested you can read more about them yourselves All right so what they did is they've looked at um, at the, the Russell 3000, those are the, the 3000 largest companies in the US in terms of 
their their their, their value, their market capitalization. So you multiply the the, the price of a share by the number of shares a, a, that a company issues, and then that's how you figure out how much a company is worth, also known as market capitalization. So the market capitalization of the Russell 3000, the 3000 largest companies in the U.S. that are publicly traded, publicly owned, is basically roughly 98% of the U.S. stock market. Which is, you know, whenever you have 98% of something, you pretty much have the entire thing, right? So it's a very good, uh, very good margin or a very good uh, indicator of what the U.S. market has done. And basically, J.P. Morgan uh, Asset Management Team has looked at how the market has performed from 1980 to 2014, so over 35 years. Now, the really interesting thing, which a lot of people don't think about, uh, if you're looking at market average performances, you know, we're, we're used to things that are uh, more or less even, you know, you're, people are used to this, the, the, the typical bell curve, right? So you might, so this is a standard bell curve. Oops, all right. There you go. So this is a bell curve, right? So people are, most things follow this normal uh, standard distribution where, where, you know, you have roughly half of cases that are above average, half of cases that are roughly below average. And whenever people think about index investing, people that don't necessarily understand how index investing works, um, they say, well, indexing just gives you average returns because, you know, it's just math. You have, if you're, if you're buying a little bit of everything, obviously you will only have market, you know, you, you, your returns, the returns of your portfolio will only give you whatever the market average gives you minus whatever your management expense ratio is. So since most people think of stocks or believe that stocks in terms of their returns, in terms of, you know, how many stocks do better than market average, how many stocks do worse than the market average. They think it looks like this, like a standard uh, normal distribution, which for things such as, you know, height, weight, many things uh, like that. In most cases, you, you have this, this standard distribution. Well, guess what? Stocks are not subject to a standard distribution. This looks anything but a standard distribution. If this was a standard distribution, you'd expect things to be like right in the center right here. So basically you would have the most stocks would be here like this, okay? This would be a standard distribution. That's not what's going on when it comes to stocks, okay? Um, so what is this? So they basically looked at this, the, the black line here is the, the, is the, 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 the average return, okay? The average return of, uh, or the, the average stock return, all right? And the red line is your median return, okay? So what tends to happen is certain companies will go bankrupt. Certain companies will not go bankrupt, but have significant de declines or decreases in how much, uh, you know, how, how well their stocks will be performing, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, actually, let me just erase this so it doesn't interfere there. Uh, so as a matter of fact, if you're looking at this table over here, about 40% of all companies making up the Russell 3000, okay, regardless of sector, about 40% of them, according to this report, about 40% of them suffered a catastrophic loss. The, 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 the report here describes a catastrophic loss um, as a decline of 70% from peak, from the peak price, with minimal recovery. Okay, so some of those companies went bankrupt and they're out. Some of them recovered, but minimally. So they'll still be, you know, 70% down or 65% down or 80% down or 90% down. And obviously, this is over this entire 35 year period. So Almost half of stocks, so 40% of stocks making up the U.S. economy, if you want to think of it in that way, have had a 70% drop or more during those 35 years. Now, obviously, those 35 years, we had the dot-com bubble, we had Y2K, we had 9-11, we had the, the Black Monday in 1987, where basically bonds and uh, some stocks had dropped significantly. 
we had the financial crisis. So many things happened during those 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 years. We had a few wars. I mean, the U.S. had a few uh, has been involved with a few wars during that time, as as well as a few additional countries. Um, so many things happen, and many things are good. There, there are all, there are also many many positives that occur, but also negatives, right? So some of these companies might have failed during one of those crucial moments. Some companies will unfortunately fail right now over the next few weeks or months. Most, though, however, will be perfectly fine in the long term. Short term, they won't be so so they won't be doing so great. But again, the governments have already been throwing a lot of stimulus at, at this problem, and they will likely continue throwing more money at it, and you know, with good reason, right? So all of this to say is that certain companies, a small number of them, specifically seven percent of companies, are extreme winners. So what is an extreme winner? That's basically a company that does uh, uh, whose returns are better than two standard deviations from the mean. Okay, so that's only seven percent of companies who are able to have returns that are two standard deviations or higher above the mean. Okay. So obviously, most of us would love to be able to pick a handful of these companies uh, that would make us wealthy overnight. Reality, though, re you know, realistically speaking, even if you do your research, even if you know everything there is to know about a company, sometimes things like COVID nineteen can occur. Again, right now it's a national, you know, um, an international pandemic. Other times it might come in the form of a terrorist attack, a massive flood, a tsunami a nuclear power plant that, that is impacted by said events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So sometimes companies, they have to react. They cannot be proactive because things are outside of their control. And when you're, when you're dealing with national level uh, events or international level events, you can only react. There's very little that most companies could have done to anticipate this or other natural disasters or, or wars and things like that, right? So because of that, it is incredibly difficult to be able to pick one of these 7% of winners. So, you know, how likely are you personally to pick one of the, the you know, 7% of com like, you know, you, you only have a 7% chance of picking one of these extreme winners. Now, if you buy the, the entire market, so you're buying the entire index, at that point, those extreme winners will be part of your, of your investments as well. Sure, you will make a lot less money than had you picked those individual companies. But at the same time, you risk a lot less in, in the form of losing money because you pick the wrong one, right? So now the reason, you, so the, the way to understand these percentages, so you have the market, the, the average market return here is zero, obviously, because that's the, the, the average market return. So you're, you're comparing how well have companies done compared to literally the, the, the market average. And whatever companies you see, whatever number of companies here, you have basically about a thousand companies, right, out of the 3,000. About a thousand, uh, about a thousand companies, in this case, uh, are at, um, are at zero. And by the way, in case you're wondering, how you how can you add these stocks, right, because here it tells you number of stocks, number of companies. And I just told you the Russell 3000 made, is made up of 3,000 stocks. So here you're just this, uh, this, this line here, this already, this bar graph, this part of the bar graph, this bar, basically already tells you there's, you know, 2,000 ish stocks here, and then there's roughly 1,480 here, and there's roughly 1,500. So, how on earth does that work out? Well, keep in mind, the Russell 3000 is made up of the 3,000 largest companies at any point in time. All those companies that have gone bankrupt over the the last 35 years get eliminated from the Russell 3000 and get substituted. They get replaced by other companies. So at any point in time, the Russell 3000 is made up of 3000 3, companies, but those 3000 companies today might be very different than the 3000 companies uh, that, that made it up 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and so on and so forth. All right. So because of that, you have very you know, you have a lot more companies that make up the Russell 3000 3, 3, over a 35 year period than only 3000 companies per se. So basically about a thousand companies or thereabouts have over these 35 years have just done as well as the market, right? If you notice a very large pro pro proportion of companies, like all of, if you were to add up all of these companies together, this entire chunk over here, They've actually done worse than the market average because if you had 
you know, if you got the average market return, you would expect to to deviate by zero, right? You had that company, that the stock of that particular company did 0% better and 0% worse than the market average over those 35 years. But many companies have done a lot worse. And that also explains on how on earth can a company have a negative 450% return? You're like, well, I figured that if a company goes bankrupt, most you can lose is 100%. Yes. However, here you're not looking at total returns in terms of how much the market has returned. You're here you're looking at how well or poorly have those individual companies been doing or the companies in those those categories have been doing compared to whatever the market average return is. So if over a 35 year period, the average market re return is 500%, then a company that scores in the minus 450%, they might have still given you 50% returns in total over, over 35 years. But if you're looking at the entire market, if the market had gone up by 500%, they're they're indirectly trailing the market by 450%. So they returned 450% less to, to investors than had they simply just been an average comp or, you know, had, had returned the average market return, right? And then obviously, then you have companies that can pretty much do an unlimited number of percentage points better than the market, uh, the average market return, because there's no, there's no up or bound limit in terms of how well a company can possibly do at any point in time, right? So another thing too is in case you're wondering how come that there's so many companies that specifically uh, you know outperform the market average by 2050% uh, over 35 years well it's simply that's where they they uh, they just aggregated all companies that did better than 2050 two, uh, and above uh, JP Morgan, when they uh, compiled this uh, report, they literally just put all of them. Otherwise, this would be a ridiculous graph. You might have, you know, one company that maybe went up by, I don't know, 50,000% or 100,000%, but it makes no sense to have a graph on that scale. So the reason there's a huge jump here is because that's all companies that are basically 250 or above percent more uh, higher than the market average over those, um, over all those years. So because of these 7% of extreme winners, so all of these companies combined here, they make up 7% of the Russell 3000 over that 35 year period. So because of that uh, number of, of outperformers, that's actually what drags this market average quite, you know, quite a bit higher up than what you would expect if you were to see a, just a normal standard distribution if all you had was something like this, right? You would expect the, mar the, the average company to perform here. So the average company to basically do 100% less well than the market actually did okay uh, if there was a normal distribution but there is not a normal distribution so in summary for this slide the key takeaways to to, to keep in mind is that uh, companies regardless of industry okay you see some industries are are more more dangerous than others so if you're looking at information technology 57 percent of those companies over this 35 year period dropped their, their stocks dropped in value by 70 percent or more and then uh, utilities are probably one of the safest things. So that's, you know, whoever is providing you with your electricity, with your water, etc., cetera, um, uh, heating oil and things like that. Those companies are a lot more stable, right? So only 13% of them went, um, um, had a drop in, in share price by 70% or more with minimal uh, recovery. Some of them dropped by 90% and recovered. Those are not included here, all right? So overall, 40%. So your chances of of picking a company that might go, you know, drop by 70% in value or more is about 40%. Your chance of picking a company that is an extreme winner is 7%. So I don't know about you, but a 40% chance of losing money or losing a significant amount of money versus a 7% chance of having an extreme winner. But in those two numbers, if I was to just pick random stocks, I don't really like like my chances of you know a forty percent loss versus a seven seven percent chance of winning, right? Um, I mean, again, if you want to gamble, go ahead. But we're talking about investing; we're not talking about gambling, right? So, well, how much can you expect for for you know uh, how much can you expect in terms of long term rates of return? Well, a balanced diversified portfolio, so a, a, a quote unquote boring balanced diversified portfolio, which again, if you're in Canada, uh, you would have a 60, that's a standard 60, 40 split. Okay. So a 60, 40 split. Again, this is, this applies if you're in Canada, if you're elsewhere, uh, it might be a bit different, but if you're in Canada, what you want to do is 20%. Okay. 
Canada. 20%, and this is the this these are stocks, so the 60% this is stocks, these are safe assets, and then 20%. This is US and then international stocks. Okay. Um, and then here some people, the more traditional uh, advisors will typically say, well, just go to, you know roughly 20% government bonds and roughly 20% corporate bonds, all right? Uh, for the safe. Now that's one approach. Another approach uh, would be this. Um, so instead of just going 20% government bonds, 20% corporate bonds, because the re rates of return are so low, you can probably go with something along the lines of 25% um, government and corporate bonds combined, and then about 15% in preferred shares. If, and again, the point of, of going with preferred shares here, as we will see in future sessions, is that these will actually give you, uh, a st will provide a steady income. Now, preferred shares, especially if you've looked at them recently, have been pretty much hammered just as badly as regular standard shares. The point of having bonds in your portfolio is that they typically go up in value or at the very least are flat or decline a little bit. Um, as opposed to stocks when markets are, are, are panicking and people are pa selling in a panic, right? So in those instances, those people that actually had bonds are currently in a position where they can start selling some of those bonds that have gone up in value and actually buy some, uh, some ETFs that are specifically investing in, in stocks at a discount currently. Should you be buying it right now or not? Again, that's really, it's hard to tell. Typically, dollar cost averaging, so DCA, dollar cost averaging, is probably a good approach. Um, again, there are a number of studies out there that that have argued that um, basically, if you if you if you do have the money, investing all of it in one in one shot, uh, more often than not, if the markets are nor behaving normally, I should say, uh, is usually better, just because it's incredibly difficult to anticipate when the markets will start rising again. As I said, as I just showed you beforehand, we've seen this, uh, let me just pull that back up again, over here. So we've seen this inc this rise, this, rec this, this, this recent rise in uh, stocks, right? So if you're going, There we go. So we've seen basically the, the NASDAQ. Let's, yeah, let's have a quick look at the NASDAQ. Uh, here we go. So, so the NASDAQ basically has had this rebound, same thing with the S&P 500, more or less the same thing with the Toronto market as well. So you see this, this rebound. Just because we've had this rebound doesn't mean that it's, again, it's done with. It might be done with. So by that theory is that if... If the market is done correcting, and this is just you know upward and onward from here on out, at that point in time, you would be better off just investing everything you have if you have money sitting on the sidelines and just buy things right now. However, as for the reasons I mentioned earlier in terms of all the economic data that will be coming up during the next uh, few weeks and few months, a lot of it will be negative. As a result, do not be surprised if markets stop dropping it, start dropping again and stop or at least stop recovering as abruptly as they have over the last few days, okay? So because of that, because of the ridiculously high volatility we're currently having, uh, dollar cost averaging, so buying a little bit, um, uh, a little bit at a time if you do have money on the sidelines, which I might, I, I should uh, specify, which you do not need for at the very least the next, um, to uh, the next five years, ideally, just because to avoid any issues in terms of uh, markets not correcting uh, enough or not coming back to their old selves in time. Um, because again, short term, year, one year from now, it's very difficult to know whether uh, we will have been fully recovered. We might. Some recoveries are faster than others, but there's simply too many uh, variables out there. There's too many potential issues that can make things better and that can make things significantly worse based on how people respond to this crisis, based on whether the U.S. is going to restart its engines before, before too early, basically, um, before they should, um, and so on and so forth. So based on all those things, it just makes sense to just be more kind of broadly invested in entire um, 
market. So where am I taking the 7% average rate of return from a balanced diversified portfolio, something like this? So in this case, yeah, you would have 20, 25% in bonds. Uh, again, that's a mix of corporate and, and, um, and um, government. And then 15 to 20% in potentially preferred shares or other form of income. Now, keep in mind, preferred shares are there typically to provide you a steady cash flow, right? So if you're looking at steady cash flow, preferred shares make a lot of sense since they pay quite a bit more on a monthly basis compared to your average bond these days. When markets crash like they have done right now and like they might do again, depending on how much bad data we're, we're com uh, will be coming out, Preferred shares will also drop in value, typically not necessarily quite as badly as 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 common shares, but yeah, so they're they're definitely less stable usually than than bonds, but they're a bit better than regular stock. Anyway, so if you have a balanced diversified portfolio uh, with the 60-40 split, this is roughly what you get to expect. So now this is from a a, a report uh, done by the Ontario Securities Commission. So they're the Canadian. Um, uh, agency uh, that is involved in um, if re in regulating the the stock market in in Ontario, so basically the the, Tor the Toronto stock market as well as a few other things. Um, so they've looked at data over this 24 year period from 1963 to 2013, and they've basically uh, looked at them on a monthly basis. In other words, for every single one of those 24 years, they've basically went from Okay, so let's look at the one year time time span, right? So when, when you're they're considering the one year, they'll look at okay, so January first, nineteen sixty to January first, nineteen sixty one. What was their yearly return? Okay, it went up by I don't know ten percent. I'm making numbers up, so the numbers that I'm telling you right now are just made up, just to prove a point. Uh, then they're looking okay, February uh, nineteen sixty to February nineteen sixty one. How did the market do? Oh, okay, it went up by eleven point two percent. Okay, eleven point two, and so on and so forth. So so they've done that for every single one of of those 24 years right on a yearly basis so it looked at the one year at the five year at the 10 year 15 20 and 25 year uh full again the 25 years they're literally just in includes the entire time span so that that one really only has uh 12 months if you want to think about it that way right of data and all of this it gave them basically this this range so best case scenario regardless of if you started on a you know on a, in January or whether you start it in the middle of the year, like on June or something. Um, best case scenario, your one year rate of return of a balanced portfolio, historically, based on those years, could have been 86.93%. Worst case scenario, minus 39.16%. So that's pretty bad, right? And that's pretty good. So short term, one year wise, yes, there's a lot more potential upside. As a matter of fact, 73% of the time markets end the year higher than they started them at, right? So about three out of every four years, roughly, you end up making more money or you, you, if you had stocks invested during, at the beginning of the year, you'll actually end up with more money than, than, than otherwise. But again, short term, that's a gamble. It's very hard to, say, uh, to tell. And again, the one to five year range, depending on, 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 on how steady and secure and safe your current level of, of income is, I probably, especially with markets the, the way they are today, I probably say stay away from, um, from investing in, in the stock market if you need that money in the next five years. Uh, and keep in mind, I'm not a licensed broker. I'm not a licensed advisor. This is, you know, for information purposes only. Everything that I'm I'm talking to you about, as I said, I'll include all the links in the the description once this uh, webinar is done with, uh, or, or this live stream is done with. Just one thing to keep in mind: um, do bookmark the live stream. I do not post the links to my live streams in my videos, so it'll stay it'll stay online, but it'll be unlisted. So if you want to be able to go back to it in the future, uh, maybe bookmark it. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so once you're looking at the five year plus, worst case scenario, uh, you know, you could lose about 2%, best case scenario, make about 27%, and on and on and on. Now, if you're looking at really long term investing, investing for your retirement or, you know, for, uh, for a couple of decades, once you're looking at the, you know, 20 or 25 year periods, worst case scenario, you'll make 6.66 or 6.95%. So which is pretty much in line with what other studies have found that if you're a long-term invest, uh, investor, what you can expect from a balanced diversified portfolio is roughly 7% per year, okay? 
So again, that's a worst case scenario according to this data set. Best case scenario is 13.76, and that's why some advisors will sometimes tell you that a diversified, a balanced and diversified portfolio might give you about 10% or so. Honestly, they're a bit optimistic, and yes, technically speaking, 10% is pretty much in the middle of the range here, but I'd rather you, you know, again, plan for the worst, hope for the best. There's no reason to freak out about anything, but yeah. Don't 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 be overly optimistic. So you know, with Trump saying that uh, you know the U.S. should reopen by next week or by by Easter or whatever, and everything should be open and everyone should just go about their daily business. While that would be a good thing for the economy short term, that would be probably a really bad idea long term. And I'll show you the stats in a second in terms of why propagation rate when it comes to exponential growth is a really really bad thing, and you have to pay attention to it. Okay. All right. So that's just a piece of, so you'll tell me, well, you know, that just goes back to 1960. We need more data. We want to see longer term. All right, fine. Um, so if you want more longer term data, this is a very useful one. Now, again, you'll notice this is a print screen from this version of their website from 2015. Uh, I, in the, like if, you know, the link that I'll, I'll post on the, uh, in, in the description will actually have the, the most up-to-date information that goes all the way to 2019. Um, one thing that I would like you to point uh, to, uh, what, what I'd like to point out to you, you see these downturns here. It, here it tells you by how much the downturn was in terms of how much money was lost during that. Uh, you know what was the the market crash basically, all right? So here we, we, uh, markets contracted by 43 percent, 43 percent, 27, 20, 25, uh, 39, 35, and 25. So that the the data that I just showed you that basically went from 1960 that literally includes. And, and everything that you see in gray were basically short-term recessions or basically contractions of the of the economy, right? And then some of those contractions had significant downturns for um, for the stock market. Others, they, they just had a slowdown in the economy and the market didn't see any substantial, like like over here, for example, didn't see any substantial, or, or this one in, in the early, uh, in early 80, didn't see any substantial crash in stock markets. So the uh, Black Monday that I mentioned already before was in October 1987, had a 25% uh, drop in stock mar uh, in the stock market, basically, okay? So here in this lighter blue uh, color, you see the, the US stocks. So this is literally just the US stock market. Um, it's gone up by 11.3% per year, and this is going back all the way to 1934. So right after um, the, the Great Depression, um, but before World War II, and before the, the, the Korean or the Vietnam War, and all the other uh, recessions uh, since, right? Canadian stocks, 9.8%, so those are in red. Bonds, 6.3%, obviously bonds these days pay a lot less than that. Um, Short-term bonds are also known as T-bills, so those are regular bonds, bonds of longer than a year with a maturity longer than a year. Bonds that have a maturity less than a year are called T-bills or, T, uh, or treasury bills. Those uh, have seen a, a, a smaller return, so only 4.5% here per year, okay? Uh, inflation was about 36 and a balanced portfolio, uh, according to this data set, eight point six percent. And I, the so th this is from nineteen thirty four to two thousand fifteen. Now let's have a look at literally starting in nineteen thirty five, so uh, at the end of thirty four, and let's look at what that looks like with data from literally um, from. That, yeah, that includes data from, let me just see if it, there you go. Um, so these are also the best and worst years for different types of investments, as you can see over here. Uh, so this is the all time. So balanced portfolio, worst case, 14.5%, best case, 32.4%. And honestly, last year, someone who had a balanced portfolio wasn't necessarily quite 32, but it was probably in the low 20s or high teens, depending on uh, when you balanced it, etc. All right. Um, so those are pretty interesting rates of return. So those are the extremes. Okay. There we go. And sorry, just to make that clearer. So that's your um, best and worst one year versus five years. And you see why it's important when you're looking at five years for a balanced portfolio, according to this data set, over the entire history, so basically going back to 1935, you might make 
uh, 1% or up to 21.4. That's why, you know, guesstimating a 7% rate of return, not every year, but on average, um, that's that seems you know plenty uh, reasonable uh, reasonable enough, right? So keep in mind, yes, we're going through troubled times right now. Yes, it's one of those extreme economic and historical events. But so was World War II. So was the Vietnam and the Korean Wars. So was the uh, you know 9/11 and the dot com bubble and then subsequently 9/11, and so was the the recent financial crisis of 2007-2009. Individual companies will fail. Certain industries will be impacted more than others. The market overall, however, will be just fine. The same way it's been just fine over, you know, the last uh, century or so, okay, the last 80 years. The thing that no one can tell you with certainty is by how much will it drop and how quickly will it recover? As I said, maybe the bottom was already reached last Friday. I doubt it, but it's not impossible, right? Um, so this is why it's important to have a balanced approach. Just realize that no one really knows the answer and might as well just invest in a little bit of everything because the market overall does come back, okay? And will come back. Okay, another important point here in terms of why you should be looking at investing in an entire market instead of just one individual one specific country is this basically looks at how uh, how large are the various economies compared to the economy of the world so this is data from 2014 published in 2015 so it's a bit dated but it's still more or less uh, in line with what we see today so back then the US economy made up about 23.3 percent of the world economy and China made up about 13.9. Today it's closer to 15%, and this is about the US is around 22. But as I said, the numbers are pretty close, pretty much in line. Uh, in Canada, uh, basically the Canadian economy is about 2.3% of the world economy. And the, the way to interpret this is basically if you're looking at the, the, the different colored sectors in each one of those countries, so the darkest portion of, of it is always the service sector. The medium color over here, that's the industrial sector. And then the lightest color over there, that's the agricultural sector. That's for the US. Same thing. And that just gives you a relative representation of how big, how much does each one of those sectors contribute to that particular percentage. So in Canada, as in most developed countries, the uh, agricultural sector is by far the smallest. And then the industry is the second smallest and then obviously service sector is the largest one and a good chunk of the service sector is currently having a massive issue in terms of uh, people not being able to go to restaurants people not being able to actually use the, the the services you know hairdressers barber shops are shut down nail salons are shut down um, most dry cleaners again depending on where you are located are also shut down um, some are still kept open to, you know, to if they're close enough to a hospital to clean certain uh, gowns and whatnot if the hospital doesn't have their own um, cleaning system, etc. But so many, many, many uh, companies are currently shut down, are currently unfortunately having to let some employees go, hopefully only temporarily, right? Um, so that's the reality. And because our economies, the developed economies, tend to be very heavy on that service sector, unless the service you're providing happens to be something that you can do remotely, that's a gigantic chunk of the economy that currently is not being productive. And companies for whom, the, the again, the... The, the next few weeks and the next few months, their data, the, their data sheets, when you're looking at, you know, when they have to report their quarterly earnings, will be really bad and whenever they're they're going there's going to be bad reports the stock market will again correct uh and at that point in time as well by how much i do not know okay but i hope this points out the the necessity to be diversified and invest a little bit and you know in everything so invest a little bit in uh again whatever your home country you should have a bit of a home country bias so if you're in canada invest roughly 20 percent in canadian stocks if you're in the u.s um, uh, and then, you know, 20% U.S. and then 20% international. 
if you're in the US, for example, at that point, you would split your international exposure and your US exposure roughly half and half. So for example, if you're a US citizen living in the US, you would invest and you're going with a standard 60-40 um, balanced portfolio approach, you'd invest 30% of all your money in US uh, companies, 30% in international companies, um, and then 40% in either just bonds, basically mix of government and um, corporate bonds or that other mix that I mentioned to you where you would have about 20 to 25 percent in government and corporate bonds and the remaining 15 to 20 percent uh, in whichever case might be relevant to you in uh, preferred shares okay um, so this is why it's important to invest in a little bit in everything and especially again in instances like today where different countries are impacted to different extents uh, by this mess uh, different countries will recover sooner right so in Canada, uh, in Canada, we were relatively quick at adopting certain measures. Certain uh, certain provinces, like Quebec, for example, were uh, were pretty much the first province to implement to implement school mandatory school shutdowns, uh, shut down the you know basically uh, a mandatory shutdown of of pretty much all non essential services for three weeks, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully we will be able to mitigate or flatten the curve as they've been saying right on the news uh, over the coming uh, days weeks and months um, and you know warmer weathers hopefully the warmer moister weather and you know more more humid weather uh, hopefully it'll actually have a similar impact on COVID-19 as it does on on the common uh, flu, uh, on the common cold, sorry, on the common cold viruses, and it'll actually, uh, you know, diminish the transmission rate as well. So if all those things do happen, then economies will be able to restart. Different economies will restart at different rates. Again, China, because they're pretty much, uh, they have a minimal number of new cases at this point. If on some days they have zero new cases declared, uh, from um, that were contracted from China, except for people that have uh, recently uh, moved back or, or uh, traveled back to China. Uh, so that economy will be doing better sooner. Now, the, all of this being said, it is not yet known whether you can catch it again within the same year, right? So especially if you're immunocompromised, it could be that some people might be reinfected. And especially if people start traveling again, or, you know, a certain number of months down the road, you might have a mandatory shutdown of certain industries in certain countries or certain areas of certain cities put in place again. If that will happen or not, again, it's anyone's guess. But as I said, more than ever, is it's it's more important than ever right now to instead of just trying to pick winning stocks or try to pick winning industries to be diversified and invested a bit globally and it, nothing is ever 100 percent safe right and when it comes to investing there's always a risk but the only way that a properly diversified and balanced portfolio will go to zero is if every single one of the of of the constituting companies that you're investing in for for each one of those etfs that you're investing in with or mutual funds were to go bankrupt at the same time. So if you were to invest in the 200 largest companies in Canada, the 500 or 2000 largest companies in the US, the 5000 other larger, largest companies worldwide. So you have maybe seven to 8,000 different, you're investing in seven to 8,000 of the largest companies in the world. Some of them will be severely impacted by this. Some of them, for some of them, that, that impact will be only for a few weeks. For some of them, it will be for a few months. And for some of them, it will be for quite a few years to come until things go back to normal. I'm thinking specifically uh, about, again, air travel industry, right? So for, you know, things like Boeing, for example, or, or Airbus, um, when you have a lot fewer people traveling, right? Uh, the manufacturer, there's no, there's not as much demand for manufacturing brand new airplanes. And I'm also thinking at, at the airlines, obviously, right? Air Canada, et cetera, KLM, uh, American Airlines, and so on and so forth, right? So those will probably have a, f a few tough years ahead. And for the people that were let go for, or temporarily let go, hopefully only, uh, from those industries, it might take months or in certain cases, years to rehire the same number of individuals. So just saying that, oh, you know what? Alex is saying that the economy will recover just fine within five years. I don't need my money right now. So I'm just going to buy individual airlines uh, because they've, they've crashed even worse than the average stock has. 
Just be careful if you were to do that. That's a gamble, right? I have no idea which airlines will be bailed out, probably large ones, but we don't know to what extent. And even if, once they're bailed out, I'm not necessarily certain that they will be quite as profitable in the future. A lot of the travel that you see internationally is business travel, right? If people stop traveling for business for a prolonged period of time, which is likely going to be, it's likely what's going to be happening right now, it is quite easy, especially with high internet connections being more and more ubiquitous these days, it is quite easy to just develop this new habit where you're, most people will just not expect their clients or their 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 future collaborators to actually send someone on site in person to have just a business meeting for half an hour and then have them fly across the, the country or across continents, right? In some cases, you will still need experts on location, but a lot of the you know teleconferencing that w could have been done had not been uh, was not being implemented because of tradition because of it's the standard norm in that industry so you you don't want to seem like your company uh, you're, you're valuing your clients less and you're just having a a conference call with them whereas a potential competitor that might be vying for your your um your contract with that company might be willing to send four or five uh, staff over to do the presentation in person right so again i'm not saying live presentations, in-person presentations are done with, but it's a good chance that quite a few companies will cut down uh, significantly, if not substantially, on their business travel, even once COVID-19 is taken care of, all right? Um, so what are some of the projections? Well, and again, keep in mind, this is merely a model, and because we're looking at exponential growth here, uh, this model, can be completely and severely and utterly off um, as soon as you start having, you know, a couple of percentage points in terms of how many people actually start catching the disease more or less on any given day. Subsequent days, you know, in a, a week, two weeks, a month from now, the numbers could look very, very different based on the spread. Now, uh, this, I'm literally, this is just looking at Canadian data. So co confirmed COVID-19 cases in Canada. The orange line is basically the, the, the model. Um, and this, uh, uh, this model basically uses a roughly 20 to 25% because it's, it's, it, it, it gets adjusted over time. So there are a few adjustments over here where basically once you start having a certain number of individuals that are, have contracted the, uh, the, the disease and you have quarantine measures put in place and once you start having uh, things such as you know warmer weather and a assuming that uh, the propagation rate drops by more or less the same rate as you would have, um, you would expect it to drop if it's if it behaves like the common cold, which is also coronavirus. Um, at that point in time, you will, you know, the, the rates actually drop significantly close to uh, just a, a uh, you know, 5%, 2%, etc. So long story short, in red, you see the confirmed cases up until what has currently been um, uh, reported today uh, by the various Canadian um, um, provincial prime ministers, uh, by the prime minister and the provincial leaders. Um, this line at the end of day today, the, the model forecasts 4,051. We'll see. Um, the data is not in yet, but as you can see, it's pretty close to the model projections. Okay. So my next live stream will be next Thursday, just uh, just to see how good or bad this, this forecast is. And by next Thursday, assuming things don't change significantly or substantially by then, you'd expect 11,338 uh, new case, uh, total COVID-19 cases. So not new cases, but overall cases by then. This doesn't mean that's the number of total people that, that cur at any point in time have the disease, that just the number of people that have had it, and some of them will have, um, you know, been uh, been um, will have been able to actually fight it off, basically, right? But that's just the total number of cases. Okay, so that's just so you see the numbers of what the forecast of this particular model, which is just a model. I'm not guarantee. I cannot guarantee you this will be accurate, but if yeah, if things continue the way they have. You'd expect roughly 11,300 cases by next Thursday, by next presentation. And now if you were to take the exact same model, so right now, you know, what I just showed you in the previous uh, slide is literally exactly the exact same model, same data, it's just that I basically zoomed in here. So the previous slide was literally just that, that little square over there. So if you were to zoom out, 
Um, and again, here it becomes much more guesswork in many ways um, because here you, you see it's not a perfect inflection curve. So you see here, right at this point, um, the curve shifts significantly. The reason that I sh that this one shifts significantly there, uh, I'm using slightly different data uh, from here going onward because now you're basically at that point you're you're pretty much in mid-May so um, uh, temperatures rise so I, I basically here I'm I'm adding I've added a new um, new data to the model that would try to mimic the drop in 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 spread if if COVID-19 behaves like the common cold will it I have no idea if it does then you know, then it'll drop like that. If it doesn't and just the previous data holds true, then your numbers will unfortunately keep on going up like this, okay? Uh, so again, it's a long term, it's a guess all over the place. Just I've been getting so many emails from, from students and, and colleagues asking me, you know, do you have any idea of roughly where this is heading? Um, well, yeah, there you go. That's, that's an estimate, but it's a very, very vague estimate. Um, and what I'm hoping for is, you know, to actually see to see this drop like that. And keep in mind, this is just the total number of cases. So this is not how many people at any point in time have it, right? Uh, if you were to, and I, I, I'll probably post by next week, I'll, 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 I'll post one of those. I'll, I, I, might, I might post it in the description of this uh, as well after I, I graph it tonight. Um, if you were to actually look at how many people have actually been cured or basically have, um, uh, have, are no longer symptomatic and are, can no longer transmit the disease. Obviously, at that point, you would you know you would expect once you reach that level, you know that 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 the total the the number of of individuals to start dropping slowly, something like this. But the total number of cases, you would still see a, a, a slight increase until you obviously once you get to this point over here, uh, when you have basically a zero per, uh, zero new cases. At that point, yeah, you might see a significant drop. The problem afterwards, obviously, is we're coming back. Uh, to the next winter season and cold season and unfortunately um, these sorts of viruses so coronaviruses uh, which again cause the common flu uh, common cold uh, and the influenza virus which ca causes the, the the flu they tend to propagate a lot better in close quarters so when it's colder for those of us that live in northern countries we're more likely to be close together that's why social dist distancing is so ridiculously important to in order to prevent the spread of this um, and they, they tend to survive a little bit better. Again, this is tentative. It's true for common cold viruses. It's true for uh, the influenza virus that they survive better in drier uh, climates. So drier, uh, if you're you know, inside and you're having heating going all day, uh, you, you'll have less, less humidity in the air. Whereas in the summer, especially in, in, in cities like Montreal, where, where, where I live, um, in cities like Montreal, you have because it's an island, you have a lot of uh, a lot of humidity during the summer. So, coronaviruses, influenza viruses do less well uh, in higher temperatures and uh, combined with with humidity. Um, so, because of that, I'm hoping that this drop in rates will actually kind of match of you know if if, if COVID nineteen progresses at the same rate as most other um, cold uh, viruses uh, have. All right. Okay, so let's let's wrap this up. Um, so what have we seen today? So number one is that uh, roughly 40% of stocks do experience a price drop of at least 70% with minimal recovery over long periods of time. So unless you're incredibly good at picking individual stocks, you're probably much better off, statistically speaking, of sticking with just buying the entire index. You know, industries in general, uh, countries, and the world economy will be fine. It might take a while, but everything will be fine. So if you have a five years plus time horizon, investing is, is not a bad idea. That being said, make sure, again, you're your source of income right now is stable. A lot of people have lost their jobs. Many more will continue losing their jobs over the next few weeks, unfortunately. Hopefully, it's just temporary. Hopefully, it's as, it's as, as short of a time span as possible. But we'll have to see. Um, so if you're uncertain in terms of how, how steady your job is, 
probably investing might be the wrong thing to do because you might be forced to sell at some point in the near future when markets haven't recovered yet or even might be even lower than today. I don't know where they're going to be and I don't know your individual circumstances when that might happen, right? Um, so if you if you still have high, high interest debt, so if you still have um, credit card debt that you're not able to pay off in full by the end of the month and especially these days you know there's a lot of people that are that, that, that are struggling and we've I'm sure you've heard on the news and um, every you know on social media that there's many people that are not able to make their mortgage payments or their rent payments and that's why you, you see all this stimulus from the federal government in Canada uh, and from the provinces as well to some extent uh, as well as you know globally in, in Europe and Japan and in and, and, and the US etc um, so now it's incredibly important to to again you might you know you might not have noticed it when I was showing you that graph with all the the peaks and troughs so basically this here so a 10% drop is, you know, it normally occurs at least once per year, right? You might not notice it here because, you know, here it's like, oh, well, just a tiny drop. Yes, but up to that point, if you were to just zoom in on that, okay, this looks a lot more intimidating when you're here, right? That drop looks a lot more intimidating when you're going from whatever, you know, uh, value this represents to this other value, right? In relative terms, that's a much larger drop. Now, obviously, because now the market has gone up a lot higher than it, it was in the 1980s, even this drop here looks like a tiny, you know, like pretty much nothing, really, right, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, in the same way that um, here for the dot-com crash uh, and then subsequent 9-11, uh, you see this kind of com compiled to, to drops, but the initial drop for 9-11, for uh, sorry, for the dot-com bubble you see, things had started recovering here before 9/11 happened and dro drove markets further. So this, a lot of people were really, you know, panicking about that uh, that drop. Some people that owned individual stocks lost everything. Um, best case scenario, you know, you if you had some money available to you, you, you bought some more. Um, but again, it's incredibly uh, difficult to know which companies will do better than others and which ones will necessarily be able to, uh, you know, not go bankrupt. Now, obviously, large companies are a lot less likely to go bankrupt than tiny startups. That's a given, right? Um, but no large company is safe uh, necessarily. I mean, some, I, I don't want to say no, but most large companies could experience issues at some point in time. Some For some of them, it's, 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 it's nearer. Others, uh, it might be a matter of weeks, months, or years before they might experience problems. Uh, the banks, at least in Canada, are very well capitalized. So compared to 20, uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, the banking system in Canada is a lot safer. It's and there's a lot more money uh, on the balance sheets of banks. So there's no there's no real need for you to rush to the bank and get money out. That's a bit silly. Um, plus these days, they, they, you, even if you get cash out, you know, no one's supposed to be using uh, cash anyway. <laughs> so pretty much you, you probably won't be able to use your, your, you know, people might not want to take your, your physical currency anyway. Um, so there, there's no point to, you know, about that. So you might hear some people, you know, claiming that the world is ending. They're, they were also saying that the world is ending in 2006 and they were saying the world is ending in, in, in 2001 and, and 2000 and on and on and on right so um, again I don't want to minimize the fact that a lot of people are going through a hard time and I don't want to minimize the importance that everyone actually follow best practices in terms of keep your distance wash your hands don't be stupid and hang out with friends when you when you, when you could just easily be infected or infect them you might be perfectly safe perfectly fine yourself because you might be young you might be healthy but you're just continuing to propagate that. And that, that's basically what's going to, you know, people not being responsible is what's going to cause, you know, I was telling you over here, if the coronavirus is impacted by, by, uh, by heat, the same way that regular uh, cold viruses are, then you will see this decline instead of seeing it going up like this. But if people keep on not listening to the advice given by, uh, by by the scientific and medical community, instead of having this curve, you could easily end up with something that kind of goes up like this, which is what's happening currently in the US, all right? Um, so the more you can socially isolate, even if it seems like the stupidest idea in, on the planet to you because, you know, you're, you're, why would you want to on purpose destroy the economy? 
you you you're not destroying the economy you're just putting it on hold yes unfortunately some people will lose jobs they're temp you know it's not not only for for a temporary purpose the problem is anything that has an exponential growth uh, exponential growth curve like this even if you're exponentially you're only growing exponentially by one percent per day right that's still a ridiculously fast doubling rate right now in most developed nations you're growing by something closer to so let's let's just look at canada here just to so you see that the numbers i'm showing you are not just made up i'm literally basing everything that i'm showing you here from what um um wikipedia provides so let's just put all the numbers in context over here you see you activate it like this let me just remove the last 15. so here you go okay so these are the actual reported cases. You don't see the 2000, the the, um, the twenty uh, the today's numbers yet here. I've included them in my uh, some of them I've included in my model just because I'm I'm taking them from down over here. Um, so I'm including this. So right now you see they're at three thousand eight hundred and sixty five. Um, again, the model forecasts about four thousand cases today. We'll we'll see. But you know there's still there's still a few there's still a few provinces that haven't reported it. So. We'll see if the model is right or not. Uh, the model is not perfect, <laughs> but yeah, you can have, so right now you, you see this is the propagation rate. So you have 23, 33, 44%. That's the, the number of cases. That's the increase in cases. Now, a lot of a lot of that is due to Quebec uh, switching over and having more sensitive tests that they're, they're currently using. Um, and uh, by far Quebec is the, the province that basically has had the largest increase in the last, um, in the last few uh, few days in terms of actual reported numbers you can see here 400 400 200 basically 300 and almost 300 again so um yet you know quebec is the the, the province that has the most stringent measures so it it's it's tempting to say they have the most stringent measures yet they have twice as many cases as ontario has clearly staying home doesn't work no that's not what it means it takes between five and about 14 days to to see the data show up here. So basically the numbers that you're actually seeing right now, the numbers that are currently being reported in Quebec are not people that caught it while staying home, okay? Unless they had people visit them and that's, that's silly, right? Those are people that caught it about two weeks ago, all right? So let's go back in time two weeks, okay? So from the 23rd, let's go two weeks back in time or up to two weeks ago, okay? So that would put us to the ninth, all right? Well, on the you know, by the ninth, there were how many reported cases did we have in Quebec by 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 March 9th? Well, there was one, two, three, four cases. Okay. So what you're seeing right now is based on the four cases that we were aware of. Okay. So the numbers you will see a reduction in the uptick and this is also modeled here you might not be able to see but this is not a perfect line so that's already factored into the model where you actually see a slight decline uh i think in the previous one uh, now yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not going far enough because in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks there's actually in the model itself there's actually a decline in in the uptick okay so you you see these little waves so that each one of those little waves is basically when the model starts factoring in, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm dropping it by 5% contagion rate every week or so. Hopefully that's that's what's going to happen. So basically if today we're at 30%, in a week from now we'll be at uh, at 25% day over day and after that 20% and, you know, you're trying to drop it like that and then obviously you have to look at a, anyway. Um, but so I think it's just a model, um, but it's, it's kind of useful to, to keep in mind. Markets drop by 20% 20, uh, 20 or more every five to seven years. This is what data shows us. You know, I, I haven't included it here. I'll, I'll talk about this in a future session. I'll also have a few, uh, by the way, those of you, because I've, I've been getting a few uh, messages and emails from people asking me last week, I said I would have a few videos. I've, I've been super busy. Uh, those of you that are from McGill, um, all of my workshops that were, or all the webinars that were scheduled, um, the workshops that were scheduled to be taking place this week and last week have been rescheduled as as webinars uh, starting you know next week. I'll send out an email to everyone, those of you that are from McGill, uh, telling you exactly when those will be taking place so you can sign up for them. Uh, so I've been busy doing that. I've been working on a couple of videos, but I, I'm not done editing them, so I'll, I'll post them as soon as I can. One of them is going into detail about the coronavirus. 
um, as as long as YouTube doesn't ban the video, I think the, the only thing they'll do, they'll, they'll, they, it's not eligible for monetization, but that's not why I'm doing this anyway. I don't have enough people to monetize. Uh, it's more I'm trying to inform people. So basically it's important to take precautions and look at the data in, a, as a whole. Uh, re realize that the data that you're currently getting is, da is, are, is based on things that have occurred five days up to 15, 14 days uh, uh, ago. So if you don't see you know, if you don't see an impact right away in numbers, it doesn't mean that the current measures aren't working. It means you will only see how effectively they're working in about two weeks time from now, all right, after they're being implemented. So Trump wanting to reopen businesses within the next week or two weeks or whatever he's been saying, uh, that's, not a, that's not a wise idea. You, if anyone goes along with that, they'd be opening businesses before they have any clue to what extent the measures that have been put in place are effective. And because different states, different cities have implemented measures to very different levels, and you know, not everyone is banning, or, or there, there are no real internal travel restrictions on most areas in the US. There are some that have, that have been officially quarantined or you know, shelter in place orders have been put in place, but not everywhere. Uh, so because of that, you could easily have people in some area where you see a significant drop in cases because they've taken the proper measures, but then someone else comes visiting from outside that area and reinfects everybody. It's, it's, it, it, it sucks. It's terrible. This is, you know, technical term there. It's terrible for, for individuals, for entrepreneurs, for startups, even for medium and large companies to have to shut shut their doors for a certain number of weeks the way china managed to bring it down to zero or very close down to z very close to zero in terms of new new cases per day is by shutting down between one and two months not a week not two weeks you need to see the the impact and you need to basically you need to get rid of the people that can travel and infect others okay the virus cannot live on surfaces so which means if your workplace someone was sick at your workplace and they got they smeared coronavirus everywhere you know a few days later all of that all of those surfaces are 100% safe even if you're not you know even if no one has wiped anything right even if you haven't wiped a single inch of that workspace right so shutting shutting workplaces down not only decontaminates the workplace itself without you having to waste or, or spend thousands of dollars on cleaning. This doesn't mean that you know stores shouldn't be cleaning because obviously you have constant uh, flow. But if you don't have anyone there, you you don't have to do that, right? If uh, unless you're coming back to work within a couple of days, and then you're also limiting the number of people that might be sick at that point. If everyone just sits home for two, three, four weeks. Everyone that is, you know, still home at that point hasn't been exposed to any, someone else. They're no longer a a, um, a container, if you will, or a storage facility for the virus to spread. The virus no longer is on the, the on on the the on on the in you know in your work uh, in your work area in your workspace at at work. And then you can you know everyone can go back to work. Uh, it's just you need to wait longer than just a week or two. Okay, which kind of sucks, but. That's that's how it goes. All right. So finally, nobody keep in mind, nobody can accurately and consistently forecast the market, especially not when the market is doing what it is currently doing, because there's so much uncertainty. So I hope that's that's very clear. And again, I want to finish on a positive note. The market will recover, but likely with bumps along the way. And some of those bumps will be significant, especially if certain people convince their nation to open up shop again too early. Because imagine if things go back, back, you know, they announce that everything reopens and let's say cases are more or less controlled at that point. I doubt it, but let, let's assume, you know, let's be positive, optimistic. If cases are under control at that point in time, but you haven't eradicated 100% of the population that goes back to work, the same way that it cr crept up on everyone right away, it can, you know, you can have a second or third peak. So instead of, uh, instead of actually seeing a plateau happen within the next you know few months, uh, you might have a slight decline and then a massive uh, larger spike. Uh, so yeah, this thing unfortunately is likely going to be around for a little while. Uh, and when I say a little while, most experts seem to agree that it'll probably stick around in one form or another um, for the next two to three years. I'm not saying we're going to be under quarantine for the next two to three years. That's not what I'm saying, don't worry. Uh, what I'm saying is 
you will see resurgence of this for at least a few years. It might just become a part of the common cold mix that we have. Again, I have another video that will, I'll try to, my best to post it tomorrow because it's almost, I'm almost done editing it, looking at a lot more of the, the, the specifics. And those of you that don't know, in case you're wondering, well, I thought I'm here to talk about finance. Well, how on earth do you know about this? Again, I'm not an epidemiologist. I am, however, someone who has a background in uh, experimental psychology and neuroscience. So I know my way around a, a medical article. Um, so, <laughs> and I'm I'm pretty decent with stats, and when it comes to uh, uh, you know having projections uh, for for um, propagation and things like that. Again, I'll, I'll I'll cover this in 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 a video, and I'll I'll probably also cover it in future sessions um, if you look at the ones that are coming up. So again, thank you for taking the time out of, out of your uh, busy days to uh, attend this uh, live stream. I hope you found something interesting and and uh, useful. And yeah, I'll see you. I'll see you soon and next week for those of you that want to hang out again. Have a good one.